on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It is no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Just before we pray, we've got a, a, a new update on our app that will allow you to get our weekly chapters at the push of a button. And so if you haven't yet downloaded it, we encourage you download it today. It's called Church Center App, and you'll find Faith Family Church there. And uh, I believe it'll bless your life. How many of y'all know there's benefits when you meditate the word of God? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate in your word, to receive a word from you. We pray that my speech and preaching today will not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but let it be by demonstration of your spirit and of power that our faith will not rest in the wisdom of a man, but in the power of God. Hide your word in our hearts today that we might not sin against you, that we will do according to all of your desire. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We invite him to move in our lives, reveal and enlighten our understanding by, his, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, we give you glory. Amen. I want to read from Luke chapter 12, 13 through 21 in the New International. Please follow along. Someone said in the crowd to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out and be on your guard against all kinds of of greed. I didn't know there were different kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, a story about sowing and reaping. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. How many of you all want an abundant harvest? So pay attention. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. He thought to himself, how many of you all know it matters what you think? What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. I don't know if he said it like that. <laughs> you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever. That means you and that means me. So if this is just a fairy tale to you, pay attention, because this story is applicable. This is how it will be with whoever stores up for themselves, but is not rich toward God. In this series, we're talking about being rich toward God. The title of this series is Don't Hide It, Divide It. This is the second part. In the subtitle, I'd like to call this message Sowers and Withholders. Which one are you? While I was preparing just a moment ago, another sub subtitle came to me. What is this message about today? Identify and change. So my question to you, for those of you that are in person, those of you that are online, my question to you is, are you a sower or are you a withholder? Don't, matter, don't automatically assume. I want to, through this message, help you identify 
which one you really are. A withholder hides it, talking about money. And a sower divides it. Souls, not just benevolently to people, but into the kingdom of God. In other words, a withholder hides it from God, as if you could, and a sower divides it with God. Did you know that you could share your money with God? A sower is first a person who is rich toward God then generous towards others, and then lastly, trust God for themselves. In contrast, a withholder first trusts money for themselves. You could say that a withholder essentially is first selfish. Sometimes they look out for others, and then lastly, listen to this, They're poor toward God. Jesus says in this story that we can be rich toward God, which also indicates that we could be poor toward God. In this message series, God is really confronting us about our disposition with him as it relates to money. He's warning us about how negatively impactful stinginess is in our lives. And he's challenging us to first be rich toward him, then to be generous with what we have toward others, and of course, lastly, to be able to trust him for everything. In introducing this series last week, we talked about two kinds of people. How many of you all enjoyed last week's message? And this is where we're going to start from today. The goal of this message is to help you today identify which one are you. And then to challenge you to change. If you are already a sower, one who gives into the kingdom of God, then I want to tell you it's time to kick it up a notch. Anybody excited who's already a sower about kicking it up a notch in our sowing into the kingdom of God? But then it's also time, if you are a withholder, it's time for you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you think about it, this guy, right in the middle of a message about the Holy Ghost, this guy speaks up and he says, Master, teacher, pastor, tell my brother to divide his in- the inheritance with me. So evidently, the brother of the brother who spoke up was a withholder. He's holding back the family's inheritance. He's not distributing it the way that it was intended. So Jesus takes some time to warn his followers about being withholders. You know, I started last week also making mention of married couples who have separate bank accounts. And all week long, it just kept coming back up in me. And I want to challenge you in helping you identify what kind of person you are, whether a sower or a withholder. If you are a married couple and you currently operate like roommates financially, I want to ask you to judge yourself. I'm not your judge. What you do in your house is your business. And that's essentially how Jesus responded to this man. He said, man, who made me a divider over you? You know, I'm not your judge. I'm not your arbitrator. But then he, from there, took the time to teach and warn about the kind of people that are in the world. Marriage is about oneness. Where did that idea come into your mind to think that although when we too stand before God, whether at a courthouse or the church house, 
The Bible says two become one. In the spirit, there's not two, but one. So not only is there oneness spiritually, there also should be one mentally. We ought to think the same. We ought to make the same decisions. Amen. There ought to be no divisions in our thinking because our thinking determines our action, right? There ought to be no divisions in, our, in, in ourselves mentally. How about physically? Well, if you've ever been married or are married, oh, thank God for two becoming one physically. And that's all I'll say about that with the children being present. There ought to be oneness physically, two becoming one, praise God. Even socially, a marriage is designed around the spirit of oneness. My friend should be her friends. Her friend should be my friends. Glory to God. Where I hang, she should hang. Where she goes, I should go. She ought to want me to be around with her everywhere she goes. Come on. When it's good, come on. Amen then why not financially? Why think that it was intended for your marriage to be about oneness spiritually, oneness mentally, oneness physically, oneness socially, but then when it comes to finances, I got my money and you got your money. We share the bill for the house note. I pay my car note and you pay your car note. You came into this marriage with some debts, them your debts. (laughs) <laughs> I came into the, into the marriage with savings and, and, and money set up. Those is my savings, and that's my money. If you need help every now and then, I might help you out. <laughs> my, little, my little nephew looking at me like, man, he's something else. Well, I might not. So to help you identify if you are currently in your house functioning separately financially, judge yourself. God is warning you. There's something wrong with that. Examine yourself. Identify and change. Amen? So how many of y'all excited about this? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 24. Sowers and withholders. The Bible says there's one who scatters. That's the sower. They sow into the kingdom of God. And guess what happens? They increase more and more. Then the other kind of person is one who withholds. And they not only withhold, they withhold. More. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. They withhold more than is right, right? And what happens with them? The person who withholds from God, it tends to poverty. Then there is, come on, the generous soul who is a sower. They're generous to God. I'm not talking about generous in general. They're generous to God. They will be made rich. And we're talking about rich physically, right? Financially, materially. And he who waters, they're constantly pouring out. Not just in general. They're watering God. Can you water God? Yeah. Will himself be watered, but the people will curse him, or there will be the effects of curse upon those who are withholders to God. They don't give to God, so the curse seems to show up or manifestation of what looks like the curse in their life. But blessing will be on the head of the sower, the one who sells, or another word for sell is to distribute it. Then check this out. Come on. Uh, Who sells it? He who trusts in his riches, that's the withholder. You don't trust in God. You withhold and and trust in your bank account, and you are going to fall flat on your face but the righteous come on who depend and rely upon God who are the sowers into the kingdom of God what's going to happen with them they will flourish come on y'all help me preach like the foliage you see the Bible talks about withholders when you are a withholder when you withhold from God more than you should you actually become a defrauder I looked up the word defraud you know, that's where, you know, you, you, you have something that belonged to somebody else and you keep it from them. You are defraud. That's one of the Ten Commandments is defraud not. Amen. To defraud is to keep one from someone from something that they should have access to. So we looked at there's two kinds of people. God actually 
If you could put that note up for me. God actually instructs us not to be withholders. Turn with me in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 27. You say, okay, pastor, where in the Bible does the Bible tell me not to withhold in this regard? In Proverbs 3.27, the Bible says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is what? Do. When it is in your power or hand to do so. Is that true? Is that right? I mean, the Bible says clearly, do not withhold. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. How many of y'all know in certain organizations you'd have to pay your dues? And it's not right. I mean, you live in that community and the housing association has due certain amounts that are supposed to be collected. You should, well, I, I, you know, I defy, you know, authority and so forth. And so you're going to live up there. You're going to let all this stuff. I mean, you're not doing what is supposed to be done. God tells us in his word to not withhold good from whom it is due. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> is God do anything from us? I got a couple of yeses. And I want you to consider in your heart, because we're not talking about withholding good from just your neighbor or your family member. We're talking about you and I withholding from God, sowing into the kingdom or withholding from the kingdom. And when you talk about from whom it is due, is God do anything from us? You know, God is due all the honor, all the glory, all, come on, all the adoration, all the praise, all the glory. If we don't worship him, the rocks will cry out. The angels and 24 elders constantly surround the throne of God and give him honor, praise, dominion, and glory unto his name. Why? Because he is due. He's due. Is God due the honor that he deserves? Well, the Bible says then don't withhold from God what is due to him. Well, what kind of honor is God due? Um, how do you, in other words, how do you honor God? Do you just honor him with words only? Jesus, in Old Testament and New Testament, Jesus warned the people. He said, don't be like those who honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from him. So in helping you identify what kind of person you are, I'm asking you about your heart. Jesus also said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that means that where you spend your money, what you do with your money is a revelation of what matters to you in your heart. Early on in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 9, I'm actually concerned about how quiet it is. I would imagine that most of us are withholders in relationship to God. We're not giving into the kingdom like we should. And that's, and that's also why we're not living like we should. We're living from hand to mouth, from week to week. And I don't care how much your salary is, because you can have what appears to be wealth and still be strapped and really can't do because of how much you have in debt. And in this world system, that's not living on the level that God intends. Is there honor to God? And should we honor him only with our words and never with our resources? We talk about trusting him with all of our heart and leaning out on our own understanding. But in Proverbs chapter 3, right after he says to trust God with all your heart, in verse 9, he tells us to honor. Is God do the honor that he's deserved? Yes. Well, how do you honor him? With your words only? No. He says honor. You all help me read it. Honor the Lord. Help me. With your possessions. That's your money. And with the first fruits of all of your increase is it important to honor God first with your money somebody say yes in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 we talked about this last week and and I just want to take a minute to set it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 he's going to describe two kind of people sowers and withholders I want you to identify which one are you and be realistic I know you love God 
But he's not talking about being rich in love towards God. He's talking about being rich financially. This guy, his business was blessed. And if you're a business owner, you need to pay attention. The God of Jacob, Jacob decided of everything that comes into me, I'm going to give God a tenth. If you're a business owner and you are not honoring God with the income of your business, you are missing a tremendous opportunity to walk in the abundance of blessing of the Lord upon your life and your business. Jacob honored him out of his business and he was abundantly blessed. Let's read Ecclesiastes 11 and 1. He says to cast your bread upon the waters. That's the sower. And the waters are not waters in general. He's talking about watering in the kingdom of God. Look up at me for a moment. We brought Sister Jenny up. She's here again today. Hello, Sister Jenny. Put your hands together for Sister Jenny. What a beautiful illustration last week. We brought up Sister Jenny. We gave her $100 cash, five $20 bills. And, and, And this is true, not just for Jenny, but for every person in the kingdom of God. Every dime, every dollar, every paycheck that you receive, in your mind, adjust it and see it as coming from God. That paycheck that you get every week, that inheritance that comes into your life, everything that you receive, you should adjust in your mind as coming from God, lest you forget that it was the Lord that brought you up and out. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 warns us lest we should forget and say in verse 17 that the might of my hand and by my power have I gotten this wealth. Verse 18 says, but you shall remember that it is the Lord your God, that it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth so that he may establish his covenant in the earth. Why does God give you what he gives? It's so that you can cooperate and partner with him to establish his covenant of blessing in the lives of other people. So when we're talking about casting your bread upon the waters, we're talking about watering in the kingdom, not just being a generous person to give in this area. That If they are not preaching the gospel, then it's not about the kingdom. Well, pastor, you know, my, my, my nephew was in a bad way and, and I took the tithe and I, and I helped them that family out. <laughs> I got one person that laughed, right? But that happens. What have you done with the gifts that you so-called give to God? If they're not preaching the kingdom, then it's in a whole nother class. It's not an offering to God. You gave an offering to a man, and then by that, I hope you get blessed. Now, is it bad to be benevolent and generous to people? But no, don't take what belongs and you should give to God and give to man. Who's your source? Your nephew will forget to go. <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right. So when we're talking about being sown, we're talking about to the kingdom. Look at what happens. Cast your bread upon the waters in the kingdom. For you'll find it's going to come back to you. His word promises. Next one says, give. Somebody say give. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. For you don't know what evil will be on the earth. When he's talking about giving, he's talking about giving it to the kingdom. Giving in the kingdom, not just giving on the job and giving. That's good. That's good. Praise God. But if they're not preaching the gospel, it's a different category. We're talking about being rich towards people. No, we're talking about being rich toward God. Well, God is in people. Yes, but you need to be careful with what you're doing. And make sure you know how you're sowing. And if you give to people and never give to God and the kingdom of God and what will establish his kingdom, then I question. I'm not the God of your life, but I question whether you're rich toward God or just rich toward people. How many of y'all know Bill Gates is a philanthropist? There's a couple of amens and a couple of mm mm-hmms. But unless he confesses Jesus Christ as the Lord of his life, then he'll go to hell when he dies, right? No man comes to the Father, but by me, I don't care how benevolent. I don't care about your philanthropy. One of the richest men on the planet. Um, his name evades me. 
Warren Buffett. I heard the other day he's got something like $80 billion personally, that his net worth is like $80 billion. But unless you give to the kingdom, you'd be like this man that had an abundant harvest, was set beyond his lifetime, and God said to you, who is that going to belong to you when your soul is required of you? And such is whoever, somebody say whoever, lays up but ain't rich toward God. Next verse, verse 4 says, he who observes the wind will not sow. This is the withholder. Look up at me. The withholder looks and sees that, oh, man, it's a bad day. I can't go out there and sow seed. It's, it's a bad time. It's not good. The weather is changing. The clouds are coming. It's going to be rain. It's not a convenient time to sow. You know I got to do this, and this bill is coming up. You know I got to do that. It's not a convenient time to give to God. God knows I got needs. God knows my car broke. God knows that this situation, I got this hospital bit. God knows. God knows. God knows. And we spend most of our life God knowing and never giving to God. Woo. Man, I'm excited. This is a good word from the Lord. Yeah, I might be the only one so excited about it. Let's keep reading. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. In the morning, look at what God teaches us. In the morning or when you have opportunity, what should you do? Sow your seed. Where? Into the kingdom of God. And in the evening, do not withhold from God your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, whether it be both alike will be good. Amen? Amen. Let me keep going in my notes. So how do you know which one are you? Whether you are a sower or whether you're a withholder? Well, it's easy. What do you do every time you receive money? What do you do with money every time you receive money? If you want to figure out where you are, what do you do when you receive it? My question is, are you first rich toward God with your money? What does it mean to be rich toward God? I'm glad you asked. It means you honor him with your money and your possessions. For example, Sister Jenny, when she came up here, she got $100. If she's a sower, she would sow $20 or any amount that she chooses, whether it be 1% or 99%, she could sow into the kingdom of God. She chose to sow into the kingdom of God. What does God do with money? Well, organizations like Faith Family Church need money in order to exist. God receives the act of honor to himself. Jesus personally receives your tithe, but the organization to whom you give it, if they are a kingdom organization, will use it for kingdom purpose. When Jenny gives $20 to that organization that preaches the gospel, that organization will be able to have lights, cameras, will be able to go into the, the, the highways and the byways, and they'll be able to preach so that somebody who is under the power of darkness may be conveyed into the kingdom of life. It costs money to preach the gospel. But they'll get saved, and that child will forever be eternally blessed as a result. God honors that. And all of a sudden, the angels of heaven are on an assignment to hearken unto the voice of his word. And all of a sudden, men give back into her bosom according to the same measure which she meet. She had five 20s, gave one 20. All of a sudden, now she's got eight, four 20s, $80. Another 20 comes, another 20 comes, another 20 comes, another 20 comes, another 20 shows up unexpectedly. Now she had $100 to start. She has $200 to start, to end. What does it mean? to be rich towards God. It means you honor God with money. What do you do when money comes? There's a seed in everything God gives you. In your, in your check that you get on Friday, adjust your brain. There's a seed in there. And if you sow it, it'll produce. If you eat it, then you ate all you had. There's nothing more coming from that. What does it mean to be poor towards God? I can tell you. When you're poor towards God, you don't, when, when, when a, poor, a poor person is defined as not having enough. When you're poor, you don't have enough, right? Come on, I said when you're poor, you don't have enough, right? Well, when, what does it mean to be poor towards God? It means you don't have enough for God. I don't have enough money. I spent all my check. I spent all, I, I, I spent all of what came in. I, I, I got a bonus on the job. I spent that. I got commission on the job. I spent that. I spent that. When, when you're poor, you don't have enough. And so when it comes time, then you sit up in church. You know, you make a pretty good amount of money, but you put in a small percentage. I don't have enough to give a tithe. 
I don't have enough. Why don't you have enough? Because I've committed. I've overcommitted my income to my debts. I wanted to drive a better car, so I borrowed for it. When they do your debt-to-income ratio, they don't consider that you aren't functioning on at least 90%, not 100%. And so they approve you for what you have no room for in honor to God. And now you find yourself in a nicer house, but not enough to give to God. You are poor toward God, and he warns you what the outcome would be. Most people spend $98 and give $2 to God. So what do I need to do, Pastor? It's time to change. Start tithing. Oh, man, that went over like a lead balloon. What do I need to do to change? How do I go from being a soul, from a, from a withholder, a person who's poor toward God? In a minute, we're going to get our end of the year giving statements from the organizations that we gave. They're, they're instructed. you got to do it. And you will know instantly whether you're a tither. Let me speak for a moment to those who are non-tithing tithers. There's a lot of us. And I was like it for many years, personally and in the ministry. I was a non-tithing tither. You know what that means? That means I sort of tithe. That means I know conceptually, spiritually, that I should honor the Lord with my substance, right? And so when I have opportunity, when I got a little extra money, maybe during the income tax season, man, I, I start to hit it, right? But then birthdays and anniversaries and trips and holidays and things start coming up. And now I find my short because I'm not careful to tithe. I sort of tithe. Now I find myself in a position where I'm starting paying bills because I, I do other things first before God. And I find myself when it's time to, 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 to honor the Lord, I don't have nothing left. So I, I, I give what I can. To all the non-tithers and sort of tithers on the Internet, no, I'm messing with you all. So what do I do, Pastor? You can change. How many of y'all know you can be transformed in this life? Luke chapter 11, verse 42, as I get ready to close, the Bible says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe, mint, and rue, and all manner of, of herbs, and you pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done, not leaving the others undone. Look up at me carefully. Should you tithe? In this passage, Jesus says, For those who are careful to tithe, they ought to tithe. Should you give 10%? Yes. Do you have to? No. But what am I helping you to do? In order to go from a withholder to a sower, start honoring God with at least a tenth of what you have. And when you do, you will be amazed at the results. But how do you, how do you go from one to the other? How do you start to adjust your mind to see life differently? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect uh, will of God. Is it possible for you to be transformed? Yeah, it starts with the renewing of your mind. If you will allow me over the next several weeks, I want to teach you these laws and principles of the kingdom of God. If you allow it, it'll cause you to transform what you'll think. It'll take you from being a non-tithing tither to being a real tither. It'll take you to, from being a not tither at all, giving only one or two or three or four or five percent of your income to the kingdom of God to where you're giving 15, 16, 23, 24. You can get to the place where, like so many others, where they live on 50 percent of what they have coming in and they give 50 percent of what they have to God. I'm praying, as it was in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6, I'm praying that through this series that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and will inspire you to change the way you speak and as a result be turned, in, be turned into another man. In the New Living Translations, I'm praying that, at the, that the time will come where the Spirit of God will come upon you powerfully and you'll start talking differently with people. And then when you do, you will be changed into a different person. Is it possible for you to change? Play something softly for me, whatever it was. Amen. Praise God. And then last but not least, as I close, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you powerfully if you will allow it. And it will affect it, it'll call, it's prophecy of inspired utterance, and you'll be transformed. If you're not 
a sower, if you're not rich towards God, it's okay. You can come up. If you've been a non-tithing tither, you can change. If you've been a husband that's withheld access to the account from your wife, where you all, or, or wife, it goes, goes both ways. If you, if, no, no, I need my money. No, he didn't know. Come on, right? If you've been there, you can change. Does the Bible say you can change? The CSB says the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you powerfully and you will prophesy with them and you will be transformed. Did anybody get anything out of this word of God today? Come on, did you get something out of this? I hope you did. God's trying to talk to you. I know this is strong talk. I know it's uncomfortable. But until you change, things won't change in your life. And most of the body of Christ is broke. Most of the body of Christ is not living like the, the, the covenant men and women that we are called to be. So if it's uncomfortable for you, it's uncomfortable for me to preach it. But I, I'm committed to telling you the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Jesus warned people. How many of y'all thank God for God telling you in advance so that you can end up in the right way? Would you stand up on your feet? I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. Maybe you're visiting. Maybe you've been here for a while and you've never prayed the sinner's prayer. If you're online and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can make him your Lord today. I want you to pray this prayer. Meet it in your heart and God will save you right where you are. Say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I do believe that Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins. I believe, Father, that you raised him from the dead. Come into my heart. Save me from my sins. Lord, I repent for all my sins. And I accept your offer of forgiveness. Therefore, I am forgiven. I am cleansed. Heaven is now my home. I'm born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I just want to ask our live production team, if you guys happen to have the blessing. I, I, I want, how many of y'all want me to bless you today? Just begin praying, if you would, right where you are as, as they get that. I'm getting ready to pray over you. I'm getting ready to speak the blessing of God over your life. Hold your hand up before the Lord. This gospel that we preach is the, is the gospel of the blessing. He wants to bless you. The Bible says, can we give me a little, vo little more volume? He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. He doesn't like when his children have insufficiency. He doesn't like to see you broke and not able to provide for your family. But you've got to give him place. Learn to value the blessing. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Father, I pray over this congregation as we are dismissed today. That the spirit of wisdom and revelation will fill them to all understanding. As we speak this blessing, that you will honor the words that I speak. That they not fall upon the ground, but that they will be planted in their heart. I say as a minister of the gospel, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Come on, pray with me, saints. Yain de le rubla stifre ke le mesh de kite. Nembra kala boso remin de le rica ba yede shike te le boko. I speak the blessing of the Lord upon you. May the favor of God be upon you and upon your children and their children unto a thousand generations. May the Lord grant unto you the desires of your heart. Pray with me, church. Ke le mesh de kaya nandele bo sekite. As a minister of your gospel, I speak. May your presence go before them and behind them and beside them. May it be within them and all around them, before them and not against them in Jesus' name. 
folk. How many of you all received that today? How many of you all received that today? Hallelujah. I finish with the prayer of Jabez. And if I could look into each and every one of your eyes, I pray that God bless you indeed. May he enlarge your territory. May he be for you and not against you. And may his hand be upon your life. Be blessed today, Faith Family Church. I'll see you on Wednesday night. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he came so that you can experience a better life.